Sachin Devdhar. I uh, recently founded a small, tiny little lab called uh, Deep Sense Labs in New Delhi. Uh, we do niche projects in cybersecurity, primarily captive projects for the government and defense. So most of the work that we do is generally very exciting and interesting. It's mostly research focused, but with also an emphasis on development. So uh, nobody from DRDO here, right? Hopefully. So we are not DRDO, so we, we actually complete what we start. So uh, although they are really tiny projects, so it's easier to complete what we start. Uh, so, deep, uh, so that's Deep Sense Labs. So I'm going to speak about uh, very quickly. So it's a turbo talk, so I need to speak faster as well, uh, because I need to spend at least 10 minutes on, uh, or at least five minutes on, uh, the, on, on the demo, so-called demo. Um, right. So why is open source intelligence so important today? I mean, why is it gathering steam in terms of uh, significant amount of investment and focus and emphasis of enterprises also, private sector enterprises also, on using open source intelligence as one of the key sources of your th cyber threat intelligence. So firstly, you know, it's obviously because um, we are in a highly interconnected world. So 10, 15 years ago, we didn't use the internet as much on as many devices as we do now. So it's easier to find information that would otherwise be inside a physical file or inside a library now that we can find that same information uh, online pretty easily. Uh, we're also leading extremely intertwined lives. Our professional and private lives kind of diffuse into each other. So once again, that, uh, that what that means is if an employee performs a sensitive function inside a enterprise or a company or a government institution, he is more likely to share data between his personal and private lives. And so the private lives are less accessible, but the personal lives are more accessible. So therefore, if we pry into the personal life, we potentially get information about what they do in a, in a professional sense, so in a more sensitive environment. And classic example, an extreme example of that was the Stuxnet attack, which allowed you to actually propagate malware into an air-gapped network. So air gap is actually a myth. Uh, there is plenty of methods to actually um, to, to, uh, negate the air gap in a way. So, uh, so that's why you know, open source intelligence becomes more and more important. Uh, so OSINT has emerged as one of the most significant sources in an enterprise cyber threat intelligence framework. And if done correctly, you, can get, you have extremely asymmetric gains. Because for spending very little, rel uh, relatively speaking, you can actually get a huge return on your investment in terms of information and the value of information that you collect. Because the, as the value of the information grows, uh, you tend to start calling it intelligence and not just merely information. Um, another thing that has made it easy for us to do open, so, uh, open source intelligence is the open source movement. So uh, four, five, six years ago, um, there's an example called Palantir, which has a significant component for open source intelligence collection. The whole infrastructure and, and the tool and the, and, the, and, and, and the recurring expenses for maintaining that tool, it costs in millions of dollars. So only a few very large governments and state apparatus have Palantir. O uh, I2 is another example which could be used for OSINT. But these are not open source. These are commercial off-the-shelf products. They do not generally lend, lend themselves very easily. Although they, they're called, op uh, they're called uh, versatile products, they're not really versatile because what they, they were meant to do a certain function. And then the company wanted to diversify and they want to sell to financial markets. They want to sell to the government market. They want to sell to the defense and private sector and so on, critical infrastructure and so on. And it doesn't really work. So the open source guys got together and said, why don't we do something? Why don't we develop specific open source intelligence collection software and tools and resources and put them online for free? So you're only limited by your own imagination these days. If you know the sources and if you know how to use those tools and if you know, these are not friendly tools. I mean, by no means are they friendly. You need to know a little bit about technology and or operating systems and how to compile programs and so on to actually get it to work. But DIY OSINT is very big these days. I mean, uh, small boutique firms doing penetration testing are finding it easier to collect information about uh, their targets online than even the largest of the companies who are still stuck in their old ways. So who, uh, who can use open source intelligence? Open source, open source intelligence, if you know what I mean. So it's the government, defense, and intel community are, the, are the obviously the, the, the usual suspects. But also, more and more banking and financial institutions, telecom, critical infrastructure, cybersecurity consulting and advisory firms, and obviously your cyber threat intelligence teams uh, operating out of different information security groups. So I'm just going to very quickly go through some of the tech that is uh, available today and, and some screenshots. 
and then I'll, I'll focus in on one, and I'll show you some actual demo, live demo with the network connection. So Multigo is a tool that actually is, allows you to, uh, to basically um, go into the internet, not necessarily the World Wide Web. So anything that is defined by, anything that has a presence on the internet in terms of an IP address, um, uh, any device at all, which is out there and which is visible on the internet, not inside a LAN network, but visible on the internet. Uh, well, to a certain extent, some devices on the LAN network which are port forward in, uh, through a firewall and so on. So they also, also are pretty much on the outside. So you can map that. And you can map this by giving queries and getting results. And those results are in the form of data points that are usually mapped on a graph. So these queries actually run transforms. Maltigo calls it transforms. So these are things that take an input and produce an output. So for example, give me all the IP addresses that are live in this particular network range, a class B network perhaps, or ASN44336, which could belong to China, for example. Show me all the IP blocks, net blocks, in that, in that ASN. And then within those net blocks, I can, let's say, I can say, okay, tell me where these net blocks uh, are physically located. Are these in, let's say, in Pakistan, Karachi, or Islamabad, or Rawalpindi, or uh, elsewhere. So, and then from then onwards, you can go systematically applying the OCAMS razor and go further and further deeper into the analysis. And you can get more and more information, like what is the operating system that is running on these different IPs, if it is alive, and so on and so forth. You can also do social network analysis, which is of particular interest to intelligence community and, the, and, and, and also uh, the law enforcement, and on, also for forensic investigations. So you can do things like, OK, um, I have somebody's Twitter handle. I want to see who, who, uh, you know, who are the people following him, whom does he follow. Uh, what tweets have been publicly made available by this person and by his followers and by the people he follows, and uh, how are they all connected to each other? And then from that, from the, I, can, I can start doing net, uh, so what is known as social network analysis. I can figure out, okay, in this entire communication network, who seems to be the hub? It's the sources and the sync. It's called source and sync analysis. So who is consuming maximum amount of information? Who is disseminating the maximum amount of information? We can also do centrality uh, analysis to say, who is central to this conversation? And that is defined by, if that node were not to be present, then the graph would become uh, kind of disjointed. So, so these kind of uh, analytics we can perform on Maltigo. It's a commercial tool, but it's also a free tool. One big caveat regarding the free version of this tool is that it will only provide you a maximum of 12 results per transform. So you run a detection risk, a serious detection risk. Meaning when you do a transform and you get, let's say, 12 results. It does not mean that there are only 12. But if you get less than 12 results, it certainly means that there are only th those many results. So you, can't, you could be missing out on a much larger portion of the network if you don't have the commercial edition. The commercial edition costs around 75,000 bucks in Indian rupees, and there is a uh, yearly license renewal fee of 20,000. Another um, technology that we can use is something called Node Excel. I mean, this is totally free. It's an extension to Excel. And this allows you to do data mining on Excel and visualization on Excel and some machine learning based clustering and um, some more deeper analytics on data sets. And these data sets could be email, microblog, uh, micro, microblogging data, social media feeds. Uh, they could also be CDRs, like call data records, which are maintained by law enforcement for investigation into crime and terrorism and so on. So you can do a lot of things with Node Excel. And Surprisingly, Node Excel gives you massive graphs like that. So it tells you exactly what you're looking at. This is a raw network. When you do clustering, the same network then starts to look like this. So now you see individual, uh, so if, for example, if this is an email data set, you're gonna be able to see the individual networks within a network. So who are, um, who are the people talking amongst themselves? Uh, more so than other networks. So that's clustering. Um, this was done for uh, the Benghazi attacks on the American embassy. So this was a counterterrorism analysis. This is public domain. It's, uh, it's available online. You can, uh, it, this, this kind of shows you the power of uh, Node Excel. If you want to go over the limitation of Excel, which is 65,535 rows and so on, you can actually install Power Pivot, which is like a data mining extension to Excel, which gets rid of that limitation, run it on an extremely powerful machine, and then run Node Excel on top of that. So that gives you almost infinite capability. Uh, recorded future, another tool. This gives you timeline analysis of events. So you can then even combine Maltigo with recorded future. For example, if you want to analyze 
how Edward Snowden's revelations of the NSA spying program affected the way Al-Qaeda and other affiliates of the Al-Qaeda uh, used cryptography. So you'll see a direct correlation between Snowden's revelations and Al-Qaeda moving to more and more sophisticated forms of cryptography. So this is something that you can see in recorded future. You will actually see, and one of the examples I'll show you is something more uh, known to all of us, is the financial malware family Zeus. So in Zeus, uh, Zeus responded to law enforcement attempts to uh, identify what are known as the indicators of compromise, and uh, various companies here also uh, are capable now of detecting Zeus type malware, financial malware. Every time, it's a cat and mouse game. So every time the law enforcement and the security community developed techniques to capture the malware and detect it, Zeus responded by changing the way it worked. And so that, you can see the graph there, and Recorded Future is a tool. Again, it's a free tool, very limited capabilities. If you want the full power you need and the power, for, uh, and the power to use the APIs, which also they use, uh, they provide, you have to then use uh, the commercial edition. There is another tool. This is, goes beyond just OS and collection. It actually automates the whole process. So this kind of uh, reminds me of Bikash's um, uh, product for automated penetration testing. So an OSINT collection exercise can be project-based, or it can be made to run in an enterprise on an ongoing basis. So you have your certain exposed points of, uh, exposed points of presence on the internet, you have certain assets that are exposed, and you want to know on an ongoing basis, maybe every three months or every six months, what's your exposure profile look like on the open source? in terms of open source intelligence. What can others find out about you merely by using the internet without having any access into your enterprise, either at a human level or at a technology level? So you can run that, uh, you can do this automation using Spiderfoot. And the type of scans it will do is, you can see, affiliate info, Bing, blacklist, cross-reference, cross defacement checks, DNS, email, GeoIP, a lot of different port scanners. So kind of blend between uh, external VA and open source intelligence collection, all automated, and, and you can run it on a frequency, uh, on a periodic basis. This brings me to Shodan, which is going to be the thing that I'm going to show you in, in practice. Shodan is a Google search, like Google-like search engine for all devices connected to the internet. And it's a very powerful search engine. So this used to be called, its origins line, something called Google Hacking Database. Have you, have you heard about Google Hacking Database? G, uh, yeah. So Google Hacking Database evolved and became more and more powerful. At some point, it became Shodan, Shodan HQ. And Shodan is now focused on basically und identifying and then connecting to practically any device that is there on the internet with a public IP or anything that is reachable via a public IP through a firewall port forwarding or some kind of rules. So here you can see, for example, this could be used in state hacking. Like US wants to uh, periodically uh, scan and identify and potentially attack, acquire targets for attacks from the North Korea, DPRK. So you can use Shodan HQ to identify specific types of devices, for example, PLC controllers or um, automation, con uh, automation systems or Cisco routers or edge routers, some, some very mission critical equipment which, is, which has public IPs. And then you will then target them for attacks using zero days or perhaps the kind of exploits that your team may have developed. Um, you can do a complete, this is an example of an industrial control system zero day vulnerability that was reported recently for a PLC. So this was soon after the uh, attacks on the Natan's uh, fuel enrichment facility in Iran, the Stuxnet. So the specific indicators were typed into Shodan to see what is the exposure across the world. And this was the exposure across the world. It's a map that you can move around and you can see even in India there is plenty of uh, uh, plenty of uh, sites that are exposed to that particular vulnerability. Pakistan is as well. And then in conclusion, for the non-interactive part of the dem uh, presentation, these are some of the links. Uh, this presentation will be with uh, CISO platform, so you can go into these links. There's plenty more. This is, you know, it's a 15-minute it's a talk. You can not say much. Uh, but after this, I just want to quickly take you on a short, fun ride. Caveat, please do not do this from India. There are all kinds of people watching. Especially don't do this in the context of counterterrorism or trying to look at Islamic State and all of these, you know, the, the people in the news right now. Don't do any OSN collection on uh, targets that could 
be put you in a bad light yeah, so, because these are uh, heavily monitored kind of activities. So let me just, uh, yeah. So there are some sites which talk about Shodan and tutorials. So I've just put up some over here. It, again, the, the links are available in the, in the presentation. There's a DEF CON presentation on Shodan. Just a whole, uh, the, the creator of Shodan actually came into DEF CON recently around three, four years ago and talked about Shodan. At, at that time it was not, uh, not in any way. Uh, so I'll give you some examples. Now I want to find out uh, assets on the internet which could potentially have a default password. So um, I type in default password, country PK, and cities Islamabad. And then I get some results. So you can see the results here. NTPC, PTC, Micronet, Broadband, all the different ISPs, because these are actually Cisco routers. I don't know if you can see them, can you? I, uh, the, the screen has been, uh, the resolution is now very, very uh, low, which is why I mirrored the displays. So um, then if you see here, uh, what I've tried to do, you can even do a geo mapping, so you can actually figure out exactly where that asset is located. Um, you can, so this is in the city of Karachi. Um, you can do something similar, like, okay, 44818 is a port used by Modbus, TCP Modbus, so it's a PLC port used by uh, industrial uh, control systems. So I'm saying port is 44818 and country is Iran. So I wanna see uh, those assets that are uh, available for me now these could or may or may not require authentication. So you have to then go into the date, into what you see in the output here, the product name, vendor ID, and this gives you the initial information that you will use to profile the target even more, in more detail, so that then you can potentially attack it if you find a vulnerability associated specifically with that target. In many cases you find a target that doesn't have any uh, authentication, so you can actually, it's not really hacking, it's just freely entering. So if you see some, I'll just give you an example. I've actually done that here. So this is the Allen Bradley P PLC which has that port 44818 open. Um, okay, so here you go. Uh, there's some more uh, examples of Islamabad uh, Cisco routers. And here is an example of where I've actually entered into a Cisco router and SDN. Now, uh, my, I have Java problems in the sense that my browser doesn't allow me to execute Java because this is Mac OS X. Uh, if I had Windows, uh, you would see the, the other window I can show you is, uh, where is that window? Mm. Not this one, there you go. So that's the actual, so you can see your unsupported browser because of the Java, but you actually entered the, there was no authentication required here. And you will find thousands of uh, really, uh, the back, even backbone routers and edge routers and very, very expensive equipment, which you go in and you change some settings and you will basically cause a denial of service attack on their infrastructure. So there's plenty of stuff to do, but it has to be obviously in a team, in, in an organized fashion, it has to be done in an organized fashion in a formal way, and uh, this is only the first step. Don't think of this as a plug and play, kind of an ATM for hacking, like you put a card in and you get, a, you get access out. Uh, this is something that you, this is a starting point in most cases in a concerted exercise, maybe you're a pen, t a pen testing company and you've been given a very large client like Boeing or, or BP, uh, which have thousands and tens of thousands of assets all over the world. And you want to do first an OSN collection to see how much, what are the low hanging fruits? What can I grab just by uh, going on the internet and not actually having any access to their facilities? Because when you go armed with that information, A, it helps you sell your services better, and B, because, because the customer is impressed that you found so much already, and B, once you actually get into the job, you've already been able to profile the targets in a much more detailed manner, which you can then use that information for uh, actually penetrating the targets or, or doing the vulnerability assessments or stopping at that point. So yeah, so that's, that's pretty much what I had in mind to, to show you. I, I'm available later on in case you want to actually see the tool. Uh, unfortunately, my resolution is so bad that I can't really show you the whole screen as well. Okay, nice. Uh, but yeah, so that, that's it. Uh, <laughs>